With my experience and your ambitions, let's navigate the world of business, making informed choices and capitalizing on every opportunity. Our office likes to take time to answer questions from our audience and they can be about business or commercial real estate. And this one was about uh, commercial real estate development. And someone asked, I've been working on a commercial real estate deal for a few months now with great potential returns. The deal requires roughly $2 million for acquisition. I don't have that much, so I tried fundraising. I secured around 200,000 and committed funds, but most people were turned off by my lack of experience. I need help finding out how to source commercial developers for a potential partnership. And I also need advice on structuring the joint venture deal. Now to give you, this is, thank you for that uh, question. Um, I've worked in design build construction for seven years with a staff of about 35. And then for a family office uh, with a 23 million square foot portfolio here in the West Coast. And I currently have my own practice that works across the capital stack from debt to equity and everything in between, including CPAs uh, for commercial business as well as uh, commercial real estate. So I think it's important, um, the, the person who wrote in, um, they used a couple of different pieces of jargon that I think is important to uh, define because they can be used, people think they can be used interchangeably, but it's really good to understand uh, what they mean. So one of the words they put in there or jargon was they said JV. And a JV is usually formed for a specific project with a defined end date. So in this case, this person has found this property, they wanna build it, and so they're looking for a joint venture. Um, there's also what's called a co-GP or co-general partner. And each GP brings a specific expertise to the table, such as financing, construction design, marketing, project management, and that helps to make the project more attractive. And I found that these are great for larger, kind of more complex deals where you're transforming an urban core like a downtown or a city's uh, area that has been long neglected. Now, partnership itself can be ongoing and can cover business activities beyond just a single project. So I thought it was important uh, to, to talk about that quickly just to make sure that you understand if you're asking for a JV or looking for a general partner or just a partnership. And so for this person who wrote in, here are some ideas that I have. Um, and I think it's understand first to understand the capital requirements. And a good measure to understand what you need from a capital perspective is that your team's net worth should equal the loan sizing request and 10% of that should be liquid. So in this case, he's saying it's a $2 million acquisition so that means a $2 million net worth. And that can be with property, business that you own, um, things that are, that are you know, cash, stock, retirement accounts, that kind of thing. But in terms of cash or equivalents, it's 10%. So you need to have about $200,000 in cash beyond what you're gonna be putting down into the transaction. You don't wanna just empty out your pockets and not have any cash to be able to actually run through the actual development. Now, from a developer's perspective, I think uh, this is just the beginning. Site acquisition is maybe part one. I think more like part two or three, if this is just the acquisition phase. If you haven't done actual entitlement work, which is, I think, a developer's first question. is, If you're this person who thinks they want to be a developer and you're looking for a JV, the first thing they're going to ask is, well, what do I need you for, right? And so you have to consider the total cost of the project. So beyond the acquisition, right? That's buying the land, or if there's a building on it, do you have to demolish it? Are there environmental concerns to consider? Soils, leaks, underground storage tanks? Uh, was it a dry cleaners before, you know, sometime 50 years ago? And then there's what's called soft costs. So think of legal, architecture, engineering, design, permits, all those things are considered soft costs because your hard costs are the actual construction costs. That's when you're putting sticks in the ground, you're laying concrete, all that kind of stuff that actually refers to building that project. Beyond that, and this is something that I think most people like to fudge, are contingency numbers. And that's usually 
Um, and but this is, and I like think I said, yeah, I think it goes it goes unforeseen because you got to think about what could possibly happen. Does your electrical switch here get stuck on a container ship? Is the city unable to get you connected to the electrical grid? Um, what if you had a fire or a severe rainstorm damaging your project because it doesn't have a roof yet? These are real things that I've seen happen in projects that I've worked on. Next would be fees. You gotta pay your brokers. Take care of your brokers. Pay your bankers, your attorneys. You got title costs, you have escrow, you have property taxes, inspections during construction. The actual fund control, once the lender actually disperses the money, somebody's actually gonna be taking time to make sure that you're actually laying the foundation and putting the electrical like you say you are. Next would be tenant improvements. Now, depending on the product, if multifamily, that may not apply here, but if you're doing a retail, industrial, office, uh, do you need TI dollars or tenant improvement dollars beyond the, the shelf? And then there's what's called the interest reserve, right? So hopefully, you know, you're not trying to pay out each month while you're still building the project because you have no rents coming in. So there's either Dutch or French interest. Dutch is you're being charged as they disperse the funds where French is they charging you for the whole amount up front. And that really comes down to why brokers on the finance side are so important because we know who does Dutch, who does French, and why. Now it's possible you get the property under contract with a long escrow and you start the entitlement process. And that's where you can invest your equity in the soft cost to demonstrate your commitment to the highest and best use. Building relationships with attorneys, appraisers, architects, and engineers are really crucial here. So if you're a newbie, you really need to learn how to evaluate a developer. So one as I would look at is recent activity. Now we're leaving the orbit of COVID impacts, right? And there's some market shifts to think about. So you want to review what a developer has done in the last 24 to 36 months. And you have to think about if you're ready to become a developer is that you must understand the scrutiny of numbers. Now there's increasing capital costs, right? Rates are going up, which means that the cap rates are also going down or up in terms of how you describe it, right? Uh, if you were buying a four cap just you know two or three years ago, that same property is now being bought at a six and a quarter, six and a half cap. So the value has gone down. So you gotta be prepared for intense scrutiny of your financial model. And that should be realistic with multiple sensitivities to show that you're being thoughtful about what's going on in the market. And then there's sector specific considerations. So if you're building multifamily, for example, plan for achieving pro forma rents within that stabilization period, right? Well, what happens if you don't, right? What if uh, you projected a certain dollar per square foot and you're way short? What will you do if the stabilization takes longer than expected? If you're building retail or industrial, what kind of pre-leasing have you done or do you plan to do? Why did you choose those specific kind of tenants? Are you looking at renting several hundred thousand square feet to a big uh, third party logistics company? Or are you trying to focus on the trades where you're renting out 1,200, 1,400, maybe 2,000 square feet to a plumber, electrician, a tradesperson, somebody who builds cabinets? And then there's what I'm seeing more of is office to multifamily conversion. So do the floor plates accommodate the local city's code requirements in terms of lighting and how you can put windows or not to make sure that you can really turn it into a multifamily building. For finding the right developer, I'm a big fan of cold outreach. You know, I'm, I have no problem picking up the phone. And you can contact developers similar to your project and your target MSA. And if you're not already networking, you should join the Urban Land Institute or NAOP or ICSC and start networking extensively. And you need to practice your pitch. So you could be, you know, my name is Marcelo. I'm a new developer. I'm focusing on retail in Ventura County and I'm looking for a good JV partner. You know, get, to, get to put that out into the world and begin to feel comfortable saying that because it can be pretty intense and, and scary to think about, well, I'm saying that I'm a developer and that's the first part. So now you're building a partnership, right? You're seeking that long-term relationship and it's like a marriage. So asking comprehensive questions beyond their track record is really important here because it's 
you know, you're jumping into bed and now you're starting to share checking accounts, right? So you want to visit past projects and ask, did you come in at, above, below budget? Why? How did you do that? What, was, what were some things that went well? What went wrong? You have to check lawsuit and lien history. You know, if, if every deal they worked on, they got sued, you know, what's the reason? What happened there? And then you got to review their balance sheet and be prepared to share yours. I mean, that can help build mutual respect and show how serious you are in terms of becoming a developer. And then there's actually structuring the JV deal. So there's equity split and responsibilities. The equity distribution is you expect an experienced developer. If you're a newbie, they're going to take a significant equity stake. And it could very well be the lion's share of the project, especially if this is your first deal. You're not necessarily bringing a whole lot to the table. And so you need to kind of check your ego at the door to understand that. So you can define roles and responsibilities and decision-making process within the JP. That's pretty important. There's recourse and guarantees, right? Recourse is like, who's going to be responsible for what they call at least the bad boy carve outs in terms of making sure nobody's going to do any particular bad acts. But if there is, if this loan is recourse, meaning you have to provide a personal guarantee and you don't have the money or the net worth, they're going to do that. And the expectation is because they're taking that risk, they're going to have a bigger share of the transaction. We've talked about guarantees that enhances the deal's credibility. And then there's the profit sharing and ed exit strategy. So if you agree on a profit distribution, including returns on your investment and the preferred returns, understand that your equity might just be sweat equity, right? Which can be smaller initially, but it pays off in future deals because you're going to have that nice deal as a notch under your belt. So you can go on to the next one. And then you got to think about the end. You got to define a clear exit strategy, such as selling the property, refinancing or buying the person out. Maybe you want to keep the property and they're ready to exit. So maybe that's when you learn how to refinance the deal. Hopefully you've been saving your money and you have enough of a net worth to be able to take the property out on your own or find new partners where you become a bigger owner in that new transaction, which is the refinance. Now, lastly, this is something that I have seen over and over again, is that legal and finance structuring kind of becomes an afterthought. And I am a big fan of engaging a real estate attorney with experience early in the process to draft any agreement. And in this case, it'd be the JV agreement. And this should be for everyone involved. Don't be afraid of this. I mean, you got to make sure that you have an attorney who's rowing in the same direction as everybody else. Um, they're there to get the deal done, not lawyer the deal, right? And the same goes for architects. Otherwise, they, you know, they'll make art and it's going to be beautiful. But they're going to blow up your budget, right? So I've been in the room where everyone was happy and ready to work on a path to close. And then the attorneys kind of came in and deals have gotten blown up. Some, in my opinion, were lazy. Uh, they just didn't like the deal because for no good reason other than they just didn't like the deal. And they started to meddle and sow discord. And that's really frustrating, especially if you're a broker like me, where it takes so long to get everybody in the room to agree and to understand what it is we're doing. Um, and then there's others who just want to show everyone how much they know about the law rather than finalizing a set of loan documents or development documents or, or partnership. So having those relationships where your group is all going in the same direction is really critical. Development is one of the most high risk, high reward paths that you can choose. I had a mentor who told me that developers have nine lives and they go bankrupt in between. But I have a tremendous amount of respect for people in development because they can take a, a, a piece of land or a rundown building in a crappy part of town and create value and even change the history of the community by seeing what others can. So if you're in need of financing for your development project or your user space or investment property, we work across the capital stack from debt to equity, including CPACE, to figure out a solution that helps you, your investors, and your investment investment thesis. So when you have a moment, check out the other episodes of Profit or Pitfall in our playlist. We've run through various scenarios for business and commercial real estate that could be helpful to you in terms of how you're trying to create legacy and wealth for yourself and for your family. Thanks for watching Profit or Pitfall. I'll see you soon.